Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to review cervical degenerative disc disease. This video is an excerpt from a broader course on cervical spondylosis, which is age-related degeneration of the cervical spine. If you're interested in learning more about cervical spondylosis, we've left a link in the description. So let's jump right in and talk about cervical degenerative disc disease. This is probably the most important structural finding with cervical spondylosis. So if we look at a picture looking at the cervical spine from the front and a picture looking at it from the side, again, you can see the stack of blocks right here with the discs themselves. These discs are the cushions that separate the different blocks and you see some nice views over, it, uh, over here. If we wanted to look at just one of those pictures, take a slice through it like this and then look at a picture again, like an axial projection. This we had just talked about in the previous section. This really helps us look at not only the disc itself, but its relationship to the structures around. But now let's drill in on the disc itself. So here you can kind of see there's a belt on the outside that's a very tight, fibrous, pretty tough lining. That's a belt that contains the pulp. This structure is called the annulus fibrosis. That's the outside of the disc. The inside of the disc is called the nucleus pulposus, and that is the kind of spongy part that gives it that cushion. So those are the two parts that make up an intervertebral disc, and both of them wear out kind of in different ways. Now, this picture, this sagittal slice that we had talked about earlier, shows the discs themselves. These are nice, healthy-looking discs. And as we talked about, again, this is an illustration showing some increasing degeneration of the discs itself. So again, the top disc looks pretty healthy, and you start seeing some of the water content or the sponginess disappear. You see, start seeing some of the height loss here. And then the cushion is really kind of absent between these two blocks, C5, C6, and C7. And so you start seeing, because those discs are so degenerated, you start seeing some reactive changes in the vertebral bodies themselves, or the bony end plates. So cervical degenerative disc disease, it's a progressive aging of the intervertebral discs in which the nucleus pulposus, that center, kind of soft, pulpy part, loses its water content, so then it loses its sponginess and frequently loses its height, as you can see over here. Now, this is a nice picture that actually shows in a frozen cadaver section some degeneration. And these are unique to find like this, but you can really see it illustrates nicely a nice healthy disc here. You see some increasing degeneration over here. And then these discs increasingly look worse and worse as you go down. Like you can see this one here, not nearly as white and kind of cushiony and stuff. This one's lost a lot of its water content as you go down. You can even see some joint changes that are a consequence of this. But this is a kind of a real world picture, so to speak, in a cadaver versus this illustration. Both really highlighting the fact that the discs slowly kind of wear out over time. There are a couple of important concepts to take away when we talk about just cervical degenerative disc disease. Number one, each disc ages independently. So C23, for example, in this case looks great. The discs don't always get worse as they go down, although frequently interestingly they really do because the ones that are lower down get more wear and tear than the ones that are higher up. But this 3-4 level, the 4-5 level, you can see they look different. They're not necessarily aging symmetrically. Just like tires on your car, they don't necessarily, like your right front and back left, they might be different. They all get miles, that affects all of the tires, but the tires will age independently. And in the same way, these discs will often age independently. Unfortunately, aging is not reversible. These discs, as they wear out, there's no putting disc material back into them. So like gray hairs and like wrinkles, it's not something that kind of goes in the other direction. There is no Botox for these discs to kind of make them uh, healthier and younger, at least not yet. Uh, so aging is unfortunately not reversible and the degenerative cascade is unfortunately not reversible. Now, as discs age, they lose their height, as I've said a couple of times already. They lose their flexibility and their shape. They become less effective cushions, and because they're not effective as cushions, you start seeing some reactive bony changes here, like you can see in this level at C5-6 or this level at C6-7. The annulus fibrosis can sometimes become weaker because they're no longer, it has that height. So like a tight, like a rope or a fabric, the tighter it is, the more resistant it is to kind of penetration. But if it loses that height and it becomes a little more lax, then it sometimes cannot resist a herniation that's coming outwards towards it. It's easy for it to be torn. So the annulus itself can be weaker. This next picture does a really nice job of showing actually discs. Again, it's a frozen cadaver section, but you can see the disc itself looks okay, but there's a tear right here. And that's a little bulge coming out here 
here, a little bulge over there. Bulge here's a frank herniation where some of the nucleus has come through a hole in the annulus to form this herniation, in this case causing pressure on the spinal cord. So kind of a cool real world kind of picture showing what can happen as the discs wear out. But notice all the discs look a little bit different. In this case, there's not a lot of degeneration, but the, but the annulus fibrosis has gotten weak at a number of levels, and that's what I really intended to show with this. Now, as the discs degenerate and the annulus weakens, sometimes people can develop herniations. So we'll talk a little bit about what a disc herniation is. This is again that same picture where you can see the annulus kind of here, but there's a difference here. There's a defect or a gap or a hole in the annulus. And that happens when there's an annular tear or some kind of a defect where the fibers of that belt can kind of tear. When they tear, a piece of the pulp can leak out and it can press on the spinal cord in this case. So for example, here's the spinal cord and you can see there's some pressure on it related to this disc herniation. Now, Sometimes like when the disc herniates, it'll cause some pressure on a nerve. Sometimes it'll cause some pressure on the spinal cord. This is a nice picture, again, a real world frozen section showing this disc material right there, which is pressing on the spinal cord right over here. And you also see some of the ligament and you see the joints and some other structures, but meant to really show that this disc herniation right in the middle has come out of the disc space and is squeezing on the spinal cord, much like it is in this illustration over here. So a cervical disc herniation is when some of the nucleus pulposus leaks out of the disc space through a defect in the annulus or the belt that holds the disc together and can sometimes cause pressure on the spinal cord or the spinal nerves depending on where that hole is and depending on where the disc material is in relation to the structures around it. Now here's one example of a disc herniation, but if you took it, this, this is a different type of a herniation where now the hole, instead of the hole being here, is off on the side. So that first one that we saw was a midline or a paramedian when you think just off the midline herniation. This is something that's squeezing primarily in the foramen. So this is something called a foraminal herniation. Those, the location of the herniation is how you give them that adjective in front, if it's a midline or a paramedian or a foraminal herniation. But it's the same process though. There's a hole in the annulus. Where that hole is dictates where the stuff leaks out. And then where it leaks out dictates what it's causing pressure on and if people have symptoms from that. But a cervical disc herniation is really when people have part of the pulp leak out and press on some structure around it. And it is possible, if you think of a clock phase, for it to herniate anywhere, but the ones that most people feel are really the ones that start causing neural compression, which is really the structures that are behind the spinal, uh, uh, behind the intervertebral disc. So one thing to mention beyond just herniations, like this is a nice illustration that shows, you know, herniations of different sizes and types and locations and compression. And you can see like at the bottom, these, these are pretty big herniations. But sometimes there's not really a herniation, but that belt that's supposed to hold the disc together can become a little more lax. And so there's a bit of give and people develop a little bit like bulging of the disc so that it's not as tightly contained, kind of like, like my abs. The, uh, when you notice like here, for example, that this starts splaying open, you can start seeing an impact like this where the disc will kind of start pushing backwards towards the spinal cord, towards the spinal canal, but not be a frank herniation. So this is a herniation much like these ones down here, but this is really just a disc bulge. And so people see disc bulges on their MRI report and it's not really anything to get too anxious about. It's when the annulus has become a little bit weak and the disc will protrude without really breaking through the annulus. There's no frank herniation. It's really just a function of the annulus kind of aging as well, which is another process that really happens. So important concept of cervical disc herniations, <clears throat> where they are. They can be midline, they can be just off the midline, which is called paramedian, or they can be foraminal, like you can see in this picture over here. They can, can be uh, associated with compression of different structures. Sometimes they'll compress the spinal cord, sometimes they'll compress, compress the spinal nerve, sometimes both of them. We will talk in the next chapter about the symptoms of disc herniations and other spondylitic findings, but here it's just really important to think disc herniations can happen in different locations based on where the hole itself is. Now a herniation, and this is really important, these can resorb over time. They don't always, but a lot of times your body will kind of shrivel them up because they're thick and kind of juicy on some level. And as the water disappears and these things shrivel up and shrink and kind of turn from being like a grape to being like a raisin, it's something that can cause less and less pressure on the structures around it. And so a lot of times with herniations, depending on what symptoms people have, we'll try to manage it conservatively to see if it'll kind of go away on its own or if we have to go in and sometimes take it out surgically. 
The last thing to mention is that herniations like in that one picture I had shown can be present at more than one level. So every disc ages independently and herniations can happen in different spots and that becomes one of the considerations when we're working people up. We'll go on next to talk about ligament involvement, but the discs are probably the thing that degenerate the most, that people are most sensitive to, and I hope you have a better understanding of what degenerative disc disease is really all about. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.